Welcome to this YouTube on IFRS 18. This is the new syllabus area in ACCA SBR. I am a passionate ACCA SBR tutor. Let me walk you through this new syllabus area. So IFRS 18 is expected to improve the quality of financial reporting. That's its main purpose. It's take, been taken over from IS1, and what it does now is it defines different categories and subtotals in the profit or loss. It requires disclosure of what we call management-defined performance measurements, so basically ratios which the management want to use in communications to their investors. And it introduces enhanced reporting requirements for grouping of information in the prime primary financial statements and the notes. So it's important to understand because if it's a new syllabus area, it's very likely to be tested. So as I said before, IS1 replaces presentation of financial statements, IS1. So IS, sorry, IS18, IFRS18 replaces IS1 presentation of financial statements. And we need to just go through these terms. So consistency means that you should apply the same principles in presentation, disclosure and classification from period to period. You should disclose comparatives. You should label things so they present a true and faithful view of the item. Try not to use things like other labeling them effectively for the investors to understand. There are some offsetting rules. You should only be offsetting things that are required by a standard. So for instance, in the standards, financial instruments can be offset if they have the same characteristics and basically part of the same contract, if they're an asset or a liability. You can offset things in the cash flow statement Things like cash and cash equivalents can be offset because if you have a cash balance and an overdraft, they are offset. And also, if you're looking at deferred tax, sometimes you can def offset deferred tax assets and deferred tax liabilities. So it's really important that offsetting is not allowed unless it's required by another standard. Aggregation has been made important now for IFRS 18 and deaggregation. You should aggregate items which have similar characteristics and de-aggregate items which don't. So for example, we should absolutely show the different categories of property, plants and equipment. Now these de-aggregations don't have to be in the primary statements, they can be in the notes to the primary statements. And we should obviously de-aggregate something that's really important that's non-recurring. Uh, income or expenses and make that clear because that might be material to the financial statement in users. So there's some more clarity, shall we say, in IFRS 18 rather than IS1 on those principles. They also cover when you keep something as current or non-current in the statement of financial position and those requirements are very similar to what IS1 said. So we've got classifications for changes to the profit and loss. And what we are now having to do in the profit and loss is classify things as operating, investing and financing. Now those terms should be familiar to you they come from the cash flow statement. In the cash flow statement, we recognize them as operating, investing, and financing, okay? So it's important now that we're making that presentational jump to be similar in the profit and loss. We're also gonna classify income taxes and discontinued operations is still there, which is I for S5. Let's have a look at this in more detail. So IFRS 18 requires entities to present three mandatory subtotals in the statement of profit or loss. 
So as you can see, we've got the operating section at the top, revenue down to operating profit. And operating profit is the first mandatory subtotal. That is not mandatory prior to IFRS 18. If you go and look at profit and losses, you'll see that operating profit is not there. And in fact, we always have to calculate it because that's a key profit statement that's used by most ratios. Think, for instance, Roki uses profit before interest and tax, which is operating profit. And also the cash flow statement stops with operating profit because what we've had to do in the past is adjust the cash flow statement from profit before tax to get back to operating. So it, it is important that that is now being used and mandatory going forward. Then we've got the investing section. And the second mandatory subtotal is profit before financing and income taxes. So effectively, that is profit, operating profit and investment income. Then we've got the financing section. How do we pay our finances of the business? And then we've got the income tax. And the set third mandatory is profit or loss for the period. What is not mandatory, but is absolutely fundamental to a profit and loss is gross profit. It's, it's pretty certain that most people will be showing gross profit and also profit before tax. They're not mandatory, but they're obviously required as part of other standards effectively. And there's something that's normally been put in the profit and loss. You are allowed now to show your operating section by function or nature. So by function would be saying admin and distribution costs, for example, exactly what we had here, admin and distribution costs. The benefits of this is it improves comparability between different entities. It enables performance analysis of specific business activities and it provides a greater insight into resource allocation across different functions. If we do it by nature though, they would be employee costs and depreciation. And this provides a detailed breakdown of operating expenses. It is enhanced transparency of costs incurred by an entity, and it may help forecast expenses in the future. So part of the syllabus is to be able to discuss the benefits of showing it by function or nature. So what goes where? What do we think, if I launch this poll, goes where? We've got operating, investing and financing. So I've got six items there, but I've only got three in my poll. But if we look at them, we've got associate share of profits, gains and losses on the sale of PPE, pension service costs, Unwinding of discount on provisions, depreciation and investment property fair value changes. Which ones do you think goes where? Let's have a look at my next slide to show you how that works. So I've put some several others in there as well, just to give you a flavour of how it's working. So operating, absolutely. Gains and losses on property, plants and equipment is considered operating because you're selling those assets that you're using in the business. You're not selling assets for a business, you're using them in the business and any gains and losses go through there as does depreciation. Pension service costs is effectively employee benefits, therefore they are all operating. Investing would be investment properties because they're not what you do for a business. So therefore, if you have any investment properties, they'd be secondary. So they go through there. Associate share profits in your group accounts. Again, you've invested in another company, so they would be considered investing. And financial assets. So in financial assets are effectively investments. So any interest, dividend income or gains and losses on your financial assets will be investing. Financing is absolutely this unwinding of the discount on provisions. Anything that is an unwinding discount will go through financing. So the type of provision that you'd unwind a discount on would be a decommissioning provision. And obviously any interest on borrowings and leases, etc., also go through financing. So well done if you got that right. 
So entities with specified main business activities is another part of I4S 18. So entities can have one or more main business activity. And if that is the case, and they're normally considered financing or investing, then they need to be moved into operating if it's really their main business activity. And this will probably be tested. So if they invest in certain types of asset as their main business activity, i.e. investment properties is their business, then that would be considered operating. Also, if they're a bank and they're providing finance to customers, obviously that's what they operate and do. So therefore, that would also go in operating. Hopefully that's clear. Then we come on to management defined performance measures. So this is really all about disclosure. So it has to be a subtotal of an income or expense. It can't be an income and it can't be an expense. It has to be a subtotal. So basically a profit item. So a profit ratio. It needs to be used in public communications outside the financial statements. And what does that mean? It means um, it's included in the management commentary or press releases or investor presentations. It obviously can't be used in the main um, financial statements because they're all under IFRS. So it does though, however, exclude oral communications and written transcripts of oral communications and obviously social media. It needs to be obviously um, public communications which are written and presented to investors, okay? And they must be used to communicate um, the financial performance of the entity as a whole and they're not listed in an I, in IFRS 18, i.e. those ones which we said, or they're not required to be presented or disclosed by IFRS accounting standards. So they have to be management developed ones effectively. So they can't be anything that is already something that which would be in the financial statements. So let's have a look again at my poll in a minute and that will become clearer. So why this is important is because the required disclosure of any management performance measures used by the management in public comms, they need to disclose how they're calculated and how they're reconciled to relevant IFRS. This is making sure that investors are not misled. Okay, this is important. They need to be reconciled and explained properly because often management do try to just can't create ratios which only show the best performance of their business. So here's another poll for you. Which of the following would be classified as a management defined performance measure under IFRS 18? Got varying answers here. So let me go through the correct answer. So the correct answer is B, underlying operating profit. If you remember, let's go back to my previous slide. It has to be a subtotal of income and expenses, so a profit item. It has to be something that's not listed in IFRS 18 or specifically required to be presented or disclosed by IFRS accounting standards. So. Gearing is out because it's not a ratio that is an income and expense total. Adjusted revenue is out because that, again, is just income. Gross profit is out because that is within IFRS 18, effectively, the structure of the profit and loss. That's a normal profit term that would be used in IFRS. So the only one it can be is underlying operating profit because that will be adjusted operating profit, which would need to be explained. So this would be taking out one-offs or non-recurring items so that we can see what operating profit in true terms will be going forward. So that's what a management defined performance measure is. Well done for completing the poll. So how is IFRS 18 going to be tested? Well, it will be used throughout the exam and templates in question one will be in the new format. 
Consequential amendments have been made to IS7 cash flow statements and candidates should expect to start an indirect reconciliation with operating profit. Interest paid is now financing. There's no choice. It used to be allowed in the operating section. It's now in the financing section. In a P&L where items have been misclassified, candidates will be required to explain why the statements are not in accordance with IFRS 18. And in the past, the ACC have expected answers to simply state this will be recognised as an income or expense in a profit or loss. The ACCA will now expect answers to specify the section of the statement or profit and loss. So how's it going to be tested in the section B area will be a discussion about presentation of expenses using nature or function, which one provides the most in useful information, where there's a discussion about over aggregation or offsetting and what's allowed and what isn't, and whether they should be classified as current or non-current in the statement of financial position. Discussion about the usefulness of disclosure notes, including whether they embody the principles of IFRS 18. So you may be given a disclosure note and you need to critique it. Identification of management defined performance measures with an explanation assessment of how they've been disclosed and whether they are useful to stakeholders. And so that's how it will be tested. So it's pretty, it's pretty certain in the September exam, something will come up on IFRS 18. Could be a profit and loss and therefore it will be structured by categories or it could be a discussion of a disclosure note. Okay, so that's my overview of this new syllabus area, IFRS 18. What's that mean to find out more about my SBR course? I'm just a WhatsApp away, so take the time to do that now.